and Rebecca Bradley. This is the Virtual Crime Book Club and the date is Monday the 2nd of October 2023. Today we are here to discuss Dead Man's Grave by Neil Lancaster and Neil has kindly joined us for a Q&A. Absolutely. Hello um, everyone. Hello, thank you for joining hello. us and taking my, my time pleasure, my pleasure. Today. Um, what I will do is read out a truncated bio that I've picked up from your website, Neil. Uh-huh. Then um we'll get into the questions. I did let everybody know you were coming, so I don't know if there are any extra questions after, but I will open the um floor up afterwards. Um, Neil joined the RAF as a military police officer for six years, mostly as a dog handler, um, before joining the Met Police in 1990, where after a stint in uniform, he worked as a detective and a covert policing specialist. Since leaving the Met in 2015, he lived in Scottish Highlands, where he writes crime and thriller novels, Dead Man's Grave, which is the book we have read this month, has been long listed for the McIlvenny Prize for the best Scottish crime novel of 2021. And that was a book, a uh, McIlvenny Prize winning book was one we read last month. And Neil has been long listed for that prize. So welcome again, and congratulations on the long listing a couple of years ago. That Thank must have been much. a high point. It was, honestly, it was really lovely because the it was very early days. I don't even know if the book had been published. I don't think it had. Um, but the McIlvany rules means you can submit early. And um, yeah, I was obviously blown away to get long listed. And I was even happier the next year when my next book got long listed as well, The, the Blood Tide. So I've had I've done quite well with the McIlvany, but I didn't get long listed this year so they've got no taste clearly no yeah. obviously not <laughs> um okay our theme for this month is police staff and officers who have written crime fiction having done the job can you say why you want to write about it well i tell you what when i first started writing even though the character in the novak series which is the series before this one was a police officer he was very it was very much a thriller which i um, really liked by the way i, I love those books. i love I tom novak i i really am fond of those books um it's just it's hard to find anyone to publish them at the moment and publish any more because i mean my formative years were very much with the old school fiction thrillers uh the, the thrillers of the sort of 70s and 80s um you know desmond bagley alistair mclean things like that so i sort of initially i thought i'm a i'm a thriller writer but then i'd I can tell you this story. It's worth me telling the story as to how I, this book came about because it was Christmas 2019. So just before lockdown started, just before this all started. And I was it was Christmas at a friend's, a big house where a load of friends were staying. And we stayed overnight. And I got talking to an old guy there who was the, the father of one of my pals. And he's a big crime fiction fan. And he was a Scot, even though he'd lived most of his life in, uh, in Australia. And he said, I must tell you the story because there's surely a book in this. And he told me about back in the 1960s, he was researching his wife's history and the family history. And they went to this old graveyard where they believed some of her family may be buried. And it's in the wilds of Caithness. And I really mean in the wilds of Caithness. You wouldn't believe the place if I could show you a photograph of it. Um, and they went in there and it's just a graveyard in the middle of nowhere. And Caithness is really bleak. You think about the very top of the Yorkshire Moors. It's like that, but for a huge amount, you know, a huge amount of space. And he said, I went in there into this graveyard and there were, it was all tumbled down. And I scraped all the bracken and everything off one of the graves. And it just said, this grave never to be opened. And he goes, well, that's a book, isn't it? And I went... Oh, my God. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So it totally inspired me. I'd planned to write another Novak book. But then all of a sudden I thought I need to write something that's inspired by this gravestone. And that is how Dead Man's Grave came to be. Before, Without that conversation, I wouldn't be here now with my fifth, my fourth book um, in this series published. The fifth one's coming out next year. I would, don't know what I'd be doing. But literally that one conversation about the, the grave that should never be opened 
sparked the idea for a new book. And I came up, I decided I'd write it as a Scottish police procedural because I thought I'm living in the Highlands of Scotland. I I'm, I feel like I'm part of the furniture in Scotland now. I'm getting connected into the Scottish um, crime writing community, which is really, really vibrant. Ian Rankin, who lives up the road, you know, I go and he's a kind of a pal now. Um, so I want to be part of that. So I came up with the idea for the Scottish police procedural with Max Craigie being the hero, Janie being his slightly awkward sidekick, and their very angry and sweary boss, uh, Ross Fraser. Um, so that's where it all came from. Um, you said you decided to set it in Scotland, but they have very different um, policing structure and yeah. ways of at what point you can arrest and who makes that decision. How how difficult was that to write a book on a police procedural type book when you intimately know the English side of policing, setting it in the Scottish side of the uh, the border? Yeah, it's a really good question. And it was one that I did have to give some thought to because whereas I tell you what, Cops are cops. That's the one thing I, you know, I've lived up here a while now. My my nephew is a cop up here. I've got friends who are cops and I've made some other, you know, some got to know some other people. So I'm really fortunate there that I've got loads of people I can ask. Um, but in terms of writing accurate cops, the characters, it's easy because they're just the same. Uh, you, you must, Rebecca, in your time have come across some Scottish cops, a police from Scotland who came across to do whatever. And they were just the same as us. They didn't feel any different. So from the point of view of that, of how it feels, there was nothing to do. I did make a mistake, actually. I did start talking about the coroner. And there's no coroner in Scotland. They use the procurator fiscal, mm. who will do sudden death inquiries, fatal accident inquiries, and will obviously be there with, with the any homicides or anything like that. So, yeah, I had to read about it, but I've also got quite good at writing around these problems so if if i find there's something i really don't know about i think well how can i write around it so i don't necessarily need to delve into the intricacies of the procedures because the reality is the intricacies of the procedures can be really quite dull um and they don't make for a fast-paced page turner so the reality is i didn't worry about it too much i i found what out what i needed to know um but I find the rest of it I can kind of gloss over or I can cut at the moment when all the slightly more boring stuff is going to happen and then spin forward to something else or cut to another scene or bring in another character or something like that. So I haven't found it that difficult, but you do have to be aware because I did make a big glaring error. And it was actually when the proof copies had gone out um, and Douglas Skelton, who we both know, Rebecca, he, he sent me a message. He says, you do know there's no coroner in Scotland. And I said, well, ha. Fortunately, so he managed make... to correct it. He did, yeah. Fortunately, the the proofs at that time, because it was my first one, were just quite cheap ring bound proofs. They weren't like nice, posh, lovely ones. Um, so it wasn't a disaster. So they were they then printed some more proper proofs so that they were able to print with you know any of the silly error I made taken out. But you know, there's going to be the odd error in these books. But the way I think about it is, it needs to feel authentic rather than be strictly authentic I, I want the readers to read along with it and believe that I know what I'm talking about and of course I do know what I'm talking about but I I don't want to bog the reader down with lots and lots and lots of procedures because that would be too boring and it, it doesn't make for a page turner and I, I want these books to be page turners mm. it's boring while you're doing it never mind when you're reading about oh it. yeah I mean I sat there doing disclosure schedules for what felt like weeks on weeks, end weeks yeah yeah, quite quite literally. And now there's no way of writing that in a story and making it interesting. But what you can do is you can give a nod to it. So it's just a people... sentence. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I talk obviously there's a lot. I talk a lot about surveillance, surveillance activity, covert surveillance activity, phone tracking, phone intercepts, things like that. Now, all of that stuff you can't just do. You have to have it authorised. So I found that really with one line of dialogue, I could cover that. I could just have it that Ross will say, right, I'm on it. I'll make sure the authorities are all sorted out. And then everybody kind of thinks, well, that, you know, it feels authentic because then I, but then I don't need to do the rest yeah. unless there's a, unless there's a joke of, you know, a joke in it or 
or something I can get out of it. But mostly, yeah, you I find a, a simple cut and a mention of it, or like I say, a line of dialogue somewhere, and I think I've got that covered. It's a, it's a balancing act to go. We write police procedures, but you don't want too much procedural in them because otherwise it, it's boring. You are helping me because you seem to land on this next question. I'm going to ask you <laughs> quite at the point I want to ask you next. So I um, find with books over television, there's a real desire by editors and some readers for the book to be realistic, which we've already said it's boring. Um, just having done the job, help or hinder? And you've kind of talked around it. Some yeah. Way. I, I, but, for me, it helps. Yeah. It drives me insane because television gets away with everything. But I always get editors coming back to me and saying, well, that doesn't sound like it's true. <laughs> and then I say, trust me, it is. Yeah, because I've done it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, it's one of those again. You know, you. But I've been lucky with the editors I've had on the, these three books. They, I think they they trust that I'm I'm getting it right. And it more is occasionally they might rein me back in and say, I don't think the reader needs to know that. Um, and that's the one thing with edits, as you'll know, Rebecca. Is so much is about not what you put in. It's about what you knowingly leave out. It's what it's the things you think. Well, hang on, I can create more tension here. I mean, you know, the opening of the book changed. Obviously, the book opens with the scene in the graveyard, and my editor made me pair it right back and don't show the violence because you don't need to see the violence. You can you can assume that the violence happened. All right, so you actually had it on page. Originally. Yeah, I did. I had I had the actual him being disemboweled with the with the boarding cutlass, but my editor said I don't think you need it. Let's keep them guessing. So, and that's good. Great lesson. You know, you work with a good editor. It it helps you no end. Yeah, yeah. Um, you've already discussed the idea for it. Um, are there any characters in the Craigie novels that are set on based on anybody you know or have worked with? <laughs> <laughs> and do they know if they are well i tell you what no one is a direct lift um just because you know again you want to write some characters you make them larger than life obviously ross fraser is very much larger he's larger than life um but he is quite closely based on a couple of people i did work with you know you work with some people there was one of my bosses who was this enormous character and he was a big fella um, and he was really scruffy and he had the most foul mouth, but he was a lovely, kind hearted, warm person. He just he just hid it behind this brusque exterior. He was also incredibly skillful and really smart. But I, it just struck me that it could be funny. And, uh, you know, and I, I so to use that, that's the one thing about being a cop. It's not just the procedures and the techniques and the tactics it's the characters you meet because you all know this rebecca you you meet people all the time different people all the time criminals legal professionals just members of the public and colleagues and some of them are, are such brilliant characters that you can take aspects of all of them and you kind of make a kind of a chimera where you know you build these characters that you hope people are going to like and um, Ross was based on probably a couple of people, just with some of the things he said, uh, some of the things and how he behaves, and the fact that he had because this guy that one of the he was a DI, he had problems with gout, so he'd often come in limping into the office and he'd be really angry and red faced about it all. It just struck me as something I wanted to say because I thought you know it just makes these characters a bit more three dimensional, makes them makes you feel good. I mean, I tell you what the because they develop through the series and I keep that I add another couple of characters in the next book, um, the blood tide to, to sort of finish to, to round the team off a little bit. And one of my favorite ever reviews, and I think it was of the last book was it's when I read this book, these books, it's like meeting up with old friends again. And I thought, wow, that's great. Cause I mean, I think it's great to read about the crimes. It's, it's great to read about exciting stuff that happens and things like that. But what makes people come back in series fiction is the characters. It's because mm. they like the, the people. They like the individuals. People come back because of the dog. 
you know, because everybody loves nutmeg, the little cockapoo, which I put in. That's actually my friend's dog, because um, I put my own dog, Peggy, in the Novak books. And I needed, I wanted Max to have a dog. Um, so I gave him my, my neighbours, my friend's dog. And they said, you better not let anything bad happen to her. That's the one thing I get. I get that. I get emails direct to me saying, you better not do anything to nutmeg. So, you know, it's it's great fun. Yeah, I've just written in. It's not it's not come out yet, and it's not a big deal to say now. But um, the b- next book that's coming out in my series, she's just got a dog, so you're doomed then, aren't you? If you give them yeah. a dog, that dog has to be looked after. You've got to know where it is at all times. Um, yeah, and flipping like it's Ian got Rankin, to be forever. Yeah, Ian Rankin says he really regrets giving re us a dog he's got a dog called brillo because he keeps forgetting about brillo and because he'll write his wife will read the past because he gives his wife the chapter he's written that day to read and she'll say ian what have you done with the dog what well no one's letting brillo out and and, Re- and rebus is out doing x y and z who's letting brillo out and christ so he's got to write something in about brillo to <laughs> to keep the dog but i don't have a problem with that because he, he's a hot uh, nutmeg's a highland dog and they, they can just mooch about go around to the neighbor's house all that sort of yeah stuff. Yeah. Um, right, we're at the end just about now. You mentioned okay. Tom Novak. So will we see him again? You don't think so? Well, I, I mean, never say never. I Because the way uh, uh, my contracts have gone, I'm quite I'm front loaded with Max Craigie books. I'm front loaded at the moment until 25, um, 2025 books already written. I think I'm probably about to sign a contract for another two. So that will keep me going until 2027. But my delivery date for my next book is not until March 25. So I've got a lot of time on my hands. So you know what? You never say never. If I could find somebody to write to take another Novak book off my hands, um, I'd probably do it because I, I, I'm bursting with stories to tell about that. Actually, you know, I've missed a question. Have you got a little bit more time? Yeah, yeah, go crack on. Yeah, please do. Feel free to say no. You, I no, only no, said honestly, 20 minutes. Honestly. Just, no, I, I, it's only the telly you're keeping me from. It's no big deal. <laughs> um, what does your writing process look like? Because Hap-hazard. you mentioned writing there, obviously. Yeah, ha- haphazard. I, uh, I'm pretty quick once I get going. Um, I, 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 when I'm in the midst of a first draft, like I'm not in, I'm not in a first draft at the moment. I'm not writing at all at the moment. I haven't written anything for couple of months so i thought i don't think i'd be anything for a little while yet either um if i'm busy at it and i know where i'm doing and i've got the book the plot idea i don't have a plot i just sit and i have an idea i can write the first scene and then from the first scene i just go and i just discover the story in the same way i hope that a reader would um so i will write i can write anything between two and five thousand words a day depending on how the mood takes me um i get it takes me a while to get going because i'm discovering the story what the themes are the new characters that i've introduced you know because you have some bad guys and things like that uh what are the themes what where are the beats going to be um and it takes me a while to get going but once i really get going i can write very fast and i can you know i think my my record for the day was about ten thousand words i was a mess at the end of that day. i would have a headache no, I, I was, I was, I couldn't sleep or anything because my, I was like jittery because I had written so hard. So I don't, but yeah, it takes me about, I guess, three months to write a book. Then I leave it for a bit, go over it again. Then often, then, you know, we go through all of the edits. I'm haphazard. I might write at weekends. I might not. I might write. I never write in the evenings if I can help it. I, can, I generally start fairly handy, keep going. Best works about one o'clock in the afternoon, maybe. And, so uh, and you're it. not a plotter you just sit down and you type no i don't i do you know what i was always i always thought i was doing something wrong when i first started and it was when again i keep name checking him ian rankin said if i knew who'd done it halfway through the book i wouldn't want to finish the book because i know who's done it and so I, I also now think that if i'm not sure who it is right up to the end i try and set it up that it could be a number of people potentially and then I'll make a decision as I get towards that river and I'll make it that person. And then I might have to then go back and drop a few more tidbits in, you know, to allow people to say, oh, God, yeah, now I see it. Um, 
but yeah, I'm fast, loose, no real structure. I don't understand the writing process. I know we people have talk about methods about five act structures, three act structures, the snowflake method. I have no idea what any of those things are. I just trust the instinct that I will finish the story at somewhere around 90,000 words. Yeah, I think we all do it differently and that's just Absolutely. the way it works. That's that's creativity for you, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so what can readers expect from you next? You mentioned that you are all booked until 25. Yeah. yeah, I've got the, well, the paperback of my fourth book, Blood Runs Cold, is out on the 12th of this month um so, which i'm looking forward to then the next one after that i'll even show you the cover hang on because it's got it here which is, is called this the an w... exclusive or have you released the cover this had gone out this is actually this is a proof copy it's called the devil you know that's nice um, yeah i'm really pleased with it i've got a love of a returning villain absolutely love a returning villain um and I'm obviously aware that obviously Tam Hardy Senior, uh, not Senior, Tam Hardy Junior, Junior. Fact, yeah, is um, indisposed, but he's still got two brothers. A lot happens, the blood tide, a lot happens there. I don't want to give any spoilers away, but I do like a returning villain. So um, this is the theme of this is, what, can you trust a killer to help you catch a killer? And So uh, when's that one out? out? You've got the other one out this month. When's that one? Uh, that's out. 23rd of March next year. Um, so it's all out in proof forms and that and seeing how we go. But um, yeah, that's that. I'm really pleased with that book. I'm quite excited about it. Um, it was a lot of fun to write. Um, and that's lo loads of themes I touched on with that about starts off about a missing person, someone who's been missing for six years because I was really interested. And I think it came out of things like the Nicola Bully case and things like that. Why do some people, when they go missing, catch a lot of attention? Mm when thousands of people go missing every year as you know some are never found again and no one knows and no one seems to care Two hundred thousand so a year yeah and how many don't ever come back again and mm. so they and so I, I wanted to talk about that and understand maybe why is that why is that mm. so and then it's about using one of the hardy boys who is in prison and he offers to help find this person who he says is dead so I'm really excited about it. Great. And where can readers find you online if they want to look? I, I've got my, if you just Google me, Neil Lancaster Crime, and uh, I've got a website and I'm on all the social media platforms. Brilliant. Um, does anybody have a question they want to ask Neil? No, I think we've asked all the questions. That's lovely. Thank you so, for having thank me. Thank you very much. No, it's been my pleasure. Thanks for taking the time, Neil. No problem. Thank you. Have a, pleasure, have a good evening, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Well, Neil's very chatty. Did everybody enjoy that? Get everything, all the questions answered? I was going to ask one question, but I thought it might sound a little bit rude uh, because I was thinking, you know, there's there are quite a few ex-cops writing crime fiction, obviously. And I was like, how come there's no temptation to use ghost writers <laughs> like the celebrities do? <laughs> But no, probably because it's not that they don't have that much money like the celebrities. Because we actually do a lot of writing at work, writing yeah. state witness statements and uh, court documents and things. So we get a lot of practice mm. from the day job. Mm. Um, so I think that's why you get a lot of cops that actually come out and write because we used to sit in at a, a keyboard and type in all day. And I guess also have a lot of ideas for for stories from things that they've seen because a lot of them are writing and a lot of them are writing very well. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Though uh, th we ha you have to get out of the way they want you to write professionally into a different way of writing creatively. 
so but yeah that that's like like any a journalist to uh write they they have to write journalistically for work and then creatively for fiction so yeah so um nobody else had any questions for neil then no you enjoy the conversation very good no? yeah yeah good do you do you enjoy getting the authors on yeah good yes good good um it's been a while i had read this book when it first came out so i haven't reread it but i have read the book um so we'll go with the first question did you enjoy the book yes 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 i can't do this <laughs> yes we're getting a halfway up from clark yeah craig's thumbs up everybody else is saying yes 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 janet's yes um Clark, as you're the only one, we'll go to you first rather than all the yeses. Sorry. Um, so it's yes and no. Do you want to give us some points from both then? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I really enjoyed the police procedural details. I really enjoyed the pace. Um, and and I it sounds kind of trivial, but I I I thought the title was nice as well. Um, the things I, the things I wasn't so convinced by were that I mean it was quite interesting hearing Neil talk because he said he wrote thrillers and police pre police procedurals and this is kind of both and it 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 turns from I think it turns from a police procedural into a thriller about halfway through at the point where there's the punch the first punch up between the gangsters who are sent along to kill William Leach's sister and as an enormous in in broad daylight on a public street punch up and then and then it, it turns into um a really sort of you know I, I think a sort of James Bond gadget oriented traveling around Scotland kind of you know it reminded me a bit of James Bond actually the second half of the book and that that was the bit that I was less convinced by because per, you know just personally I don't particularly get excited about books like that. Mm -hmm. um, so that, yeah, that that's really that was really my main issue with it was that it 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 kind of morphed into this um, you know James Bond esque thriller that I just found much much less convinced. You know, I was quite enjoying that. I mean, the police procedural stuff I thought at the beginning was very interesting and actually it was quite interesting to, to hear him talk about pacing because I actually felt that it was slower paced but more interesting whereas the second half of the book was faster paced and less interesting um yeah. but yeah that's what I felt about it yeah I think we all have different um sure we all like different kinds of books don't we um we all read differently which is the point of the book club um, so we all try different things. Um, but yes, but like you said, he, he likes the thrillery kind of read, but you you preferred the first half of the book and you enjoyed that. Yeah, I quite enjoyed it. I quite enjoyed it. I mean, it, it, was, it, was, it was quite familiar. I mean, again, it was interesting having him talk about the, the irascible, overweight, uh, gout, goutish uh, boss, because... You know, I, th I, d I didn't think there was anything... I thought that it was pretty familiar stuff in the first half, apart from the very interesting police detail, which a lot of... which was new to me. Um, but I thought it was it was absolutely fine in the first half. It was when it, was when it turned into sort of James Bond goes full SAS that I, I found it quite difficult to, to cope with. Though, to be fair, the pace speeded up at that point. You know, so if that was his intention... He was successful. Yeah, absolutely. Don't read his Tom Novak books then. <laughs> okay. Um, they are very thrillerish. Um, so, who wants to say why they enjoyed Dead Man's Grave? 
what they enjoyed about it. Go on then, Craig. Yeah, I am. Um, I absolutely adored this. I've never read anything of his before, and I really liked it. I liked the characters. I liked uh, the main character, Max Craigie. Um, the way he, I liked the procedural bits and pieces as well, and and then I really enjoyed this when it did speed up and and it, you know going around the country, meeting up with old colleagues, uh, the police corruption. Um, it had me gripped from the, the. I mean, I finished it today actually because it's a busy month, but it had me gripped, and um, you know, in the end, I just couldn't put this book down, and absolutely adored it, and will go out and get the next one. It, you know, it really was. It was almost like he wrote it for me. The, absolutely everything about the writing I really enjoyed. I, I just love the pre, the police element to it and that insight. I think you get from like yourself, writers who are ex police, that, that you just have that better insight into how everything it works and thinks and and like you know the characters, the big overbearing characters of the police sergeants and or the bosses as such. Governor, I loved it. Yeah. That is definitely a Met phrase. It's mm -hmm. boss up further north. Yeah, governor is a is a Met phrase. And what else did people enjoy about um, Dead Man's Grave? No. I I have to say I thought Max was, and and I think I've read one of the other ones so. Mm -hmm. It, it's not, I think he evolves in, in the later ones. But in this one, there was a slight danger of him sounding a little bit cliche, you know, suffering from PTSD, having, you know, problems with his marriage. I also read it a while ago, Rebecca, so if I've forgotten anything, <laughs> if I'm getting it wrong. But then I really like Janie, for instance. I thought she was a really strong character. So, um, yeah, so, and and the, the boss reminded me of, um, uh, what is it, from um, D.L. and Pasco. Reminded me of D.L., yeah? Margot yeah. is nodding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A bit like that, you know, kind of rough, but with a with a good heart, yeah. Yeah, he reminds me a little bit of my last DI, but with, <laughs> he didn't quite swear as much, but yeah. Yeah. yeah I, um, I, I like, sorry, I like Janie as a character as well. And in fact, she's a much more interesting character than Max, I, I think, for me. But again, when, when it goes into thriller mode, Janie almost disappears, actually. You know, she's quite prominent in the first half of the book as part of the team. But the second half of the book is the kind of Max show. Um, and she almost is, you know, so so I can imagine that if she's developed in future books, that would be a good thing. But in this book, she kind of disappears for me. Yeah. I think uh, Dawn is... Dawn. Hi, Dawn. Hi there. I'm a little late, but... Well, you, we've just started talking about the book because we've had Neil okay. here. So okay. uh, you've not missed a lot conversation-wise. We're still on, did you enjoy the book? So do you want to say, have you got any views on, did you enjoy it or? I've only read half of it. But it um, it's really good. I like the book. Are you, so I, happy, are you happy to stay in the meeting because spoilers will be included? Oh, that's fine. That's okay. Fine. Just to warn you. <laughs> that's fine. I'm still going to read it. <laughs> okay. And if you want to catch up with Neil's part, the video will be put up tomorrow. Okay, sure. Um, so we've just discussed the characters, um, Max... Janie and Ross, the boss. Um, did you all like, we've talked about the characters individually, what about the working relationships between them? Did they work well for you? Because obviously, um, Neil, this month is um, police officer or staff writing fiction 
it's a clearer insight into how they interact with each other. Did it, was it more believable for you? I, yeah, I, I think it was, the... I think. Sorry, you carry on, Vera. Vera. No, I was just, I, I enjoyed the, I did not finish it yet. I still have like 20%, I'm really late this month. But I, I enjoyed the, the, the part that I read and the, the characters. And I could tell that, okay, he knew what he was talking about, especially all the details about the procedure and um, and surveillance and things like that. It, sometimes for me, it was a bit confusing to understand who reported to whom and how it worked. But I found it very interesting. Um, so yeah, I I found it believable. I thought that yeah, this guy knows what he's he's talking about. Yeah, Lorna, what were you going to say? I was just going to uh, say that it was I I really liked how you got Max and Jeannie and they begin this sort of partnership and you could sort of see this sort of trust in each other developing more as it went on. Um. So yeah. So I think that. You know, it it did reflect that you didn't have this sudden, oh, we're going to be this magic couple. That it did take them a little while to sort of settle into each other. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was good. Um, Neil moved to Scotland from the Met pretty much as Max had done in the books. Um. How much do you think Scotland played its part as a character in Dead Man's Grave? I had to look up a lot of books, or I mean, a lot of the words, you know, because I didn't, I think one of them was B O C H. Those round kind of cement buildings. Yeah, yeah that was a bro. Yeah. <laughs> How do you pronounce it? Bro. Oh, I can't. I, don't know if I, I read it a while ago. I, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, I just, I had to look up a lot of the words, you know, and um, that really made it interesting to me because I found out more history about Scotland. Right. Yep. I think I liked, I liked the, uh, I thought, I mean, I, you know, it's been years since I've been to Scotland, but I thought he described it well. And what, what was quite, um, so what what I liked also is is the sheer distance they had to travel between where they were and yes. is it Caskness and Miles and it's like oh because I I living in the south think of Scotland as this tiny little place up there but they're talking about a five hour journey and that sort of brings it home to how vast Scotland is or how remote some of these villages are and so that was really interesting and I quite liked that. It's yeah. not yeah. that is vast. It's just the roads are so bad and it's so twisty. It takes you so long to get there, that's all. Yeah, that's one of the things I would maybe have been picky about is that I can't see these police driving up and down to the Black Isle every day. You know, I mean, the roads would, you would just be shattered. You, would, you wouldn't be able to think. Um, no. You know, we're not, speak, there's very little motorway of, of it involved. Um, but I did think that there, I certainly, maybe because I do know some of the areas, did feel a, a, you know, a sense of place that things, how I could see how it was all fitting together. And one of the bits I liked is, well, um, when, who was it? The cafe's husband, you know, the owner's husband, who was the car crash. Mm -hmm. You know that that um, his car was sent off the road, um, and where it was described. And I'd had a conversation with my son-in-law just a couple of weeks ago, who actually comes from Brora, um, about these roads up at Berrydale um, and how you can just go straight over the cliff. So you know, it obviously resounded with me when when I was reading that. So it really did have the sense of place. For people familiar with the area, it was. It, well, yeah. it did for me, yes. Yeah. 
I like the, the ant with the dolphins because my, my daughter had been up there just about two weeks ago and saw the dolphins off that point. So that really brought that home. Wow. So it's actually been one of the books with the clearest sense of place that readers have connected with so far, I think. Yep. Yes, it described Scotland quite well, I thought. Yeah. Hmm. I think Jane, 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 Jane likes the likes the um, industrial parts, you know, the, the busy parts around Glasgow and Edinburgh, and then then you you've got the contrast with the with the deserted Caithness scenery. So I thought that thought that was quite quite good. Yeah, yeah. Um. So. Were you? trying to, it was a police procedural, were you trying to figure out when you were reading it, bearing in mind Neil said his writing process was, he doesn't know who's done it while he's writing it. Were you trying to figure things out as you were reading it? Well, yes, you're always trying to do that. <laughs> sometimes successfully, sometimes not. <laughs> Who was successful? Anybody? No. I mean, one knew the Hardys were behind it, but I, did, yeah, apart from the main bent police officers, was it Slattery or Slattery and McGee, and and it was, it, you know, but there was lots of teasing with the telephone yeah. when he's doing the telephones to the burner phones, and then he was talking to the burner phones just as Janie put her phone down. I was like, oh my god, I was so desperate for it not to be. Yeah, sort of yeah I was worried about that too. <laughs> yeah, but um, not a clue until they revealed at the end. How did it feel reading about bent police officers in the current climate? Because Ooh. it's not very often that we find them in fiction. Was it? Was it good to find them in fiction, or how did you feel having? I thought it made a good story. I mean, if I was going to ask him a question, it was going to be, why did he have so much on corruption? And, you know, you can imagine, certainly the Met today is all about trying to, you know, get rid of the corruption in the social, but why write so much and, and so much about corruption within your book? But I really enjoyed it. And, and, and you know, you wanted to, for me, I wanted to find the 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 bent police officers and I'm, I'm disappointed a little bit in the end because I, I didn't like that ending I would rather them spend a long time in prison but you know although some did but you know that's the only negative thing and that's a personal thing it's like serve your time you've done the crime yeah. one, one, of, one of the things I wondered about was yeah I know that you know police obviously come into contact with criminals and they're you know, in any police force, there is a certain amount of corruption and opportunity for that sort of thing. But would someone so senior be 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 corrupted and be be helping? You know, the Hardy gang. You know, I can I can imagine it at and and clearly it does happen at lower levels. But is it believable that someone so senior would be corrupted? Would be passing information to criminals? Yeah. It depends if they were corrupted when they were lower down the ranks. Which is what happened in the book, I think. Yeah. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So once they're corrupted, then it just goes with them up the ranks. Um, so, yes. If was... Yeah, I, I was going to say that actually, although we don't see it that often in books, and I'm speaking now English books, you know, because you do see it in other countries where they have traditionally had a corrupt police force and people aren't that, um, you know, don't trust the police that much. But uh, but on the other hand, we have seen quite a lot of it in, on TV. I'm thinking Line of Duty, which I think was precedes this this book. So, um yeah, and, and at senior levels as well there as well, so. And Craig, talking of why Neil does it, I think he's a big fan of Line of Duty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. I think it's also, do you think that 
if you know, it must take a certain amount of years for anybody to reach a senior position. I know you get your graduate fast tracks and all the rest of it, but a lot of these, at least what I would take from the book is a lot of these um, young policemen that the Hardys would have been corrupting when they were new into the force would have probably taken them quite a while to go to reach these positions. And so you're kind of looking at historical corruption and it's just sort of maybe going to be more difficult in the future to um, have, you know, to, to corrupt a, a young police officer coming in and for them to come up and not, not be discovered, which I think was easier. And, you know, if you go back to your sort of idea of working your way up or whatever. I thought it was ironic that the, the Met Police were coming up to sort out corruption in Scotland. I thought it might have been the other way around. <laughs> yes, really it was. Um, but also, there has been an incident in this country where a young man was corrupted by a gang before he even joined the police and his sole purpose of joining was to be the gang's eyes and ears. Oh. And he made it as far as detective before mm. he was found out. And that was a massive story in the press at the time. I got the impression that the Hardys, because they were an intergenerational crime family, tried to corrupt everybody. And then I think it was Wilbur, he was the top senior officer that committed suicide. I got the impression, and maybe incorrectly, that they didn't call on him on a regular basis. He was like a mole. So when they needed him, they they had somebody that at the highest level that they could call upon. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I found that very believable because the family had been around so long that I think they just took a shot at everybody, you know, and um, and some people. And then if if they went along, except like Wilbur did when he was very young and accepted some money, you know, that was good. They kept kept track of it. And if not, then they just moved on because there were lots of opportunities for them. And uh, they had lots of resources and different ways of corrupting people. So, but um, I, I found uh, that really interesting. Mm. And I, I agree with Clark, it was as if there were two different books here. One was a slower paced. I actually don't like um, crime family books that this type of story, um, nor do I like thrillers, but I was, boy, I was, and I was reading on a Kindle, flipping my finger very quickly as uh, as as the uh, plot progressed. And I I did enjoy the uh, NC 500, which I had to look up and find out about and and think about if if uh, that uh, that uh, tourist road is in my my future. It really uh, was a, um, a book that really made you want to visit Scotland. You wouldn't want to do it in summer, I believe. It's so yeah. overused these days. I've, I've been um, in the, I've done the NC five hundred. Uh, it's it's dreadful in the summer. It's a traffic jam. It's a traffic jam. jam. Yeah, um, this this point that Lorna made about driving to Gaith Ness, you know, it, it takes forever to get there, and when you, when you drive around, it's like you never get out of third gear. You never go above thirty miles an hour. You know, you're absolutely exhausted. You know, you can't you can't commute to Cape Ness and back and things like that. It's very, it, very busy. Is it drivable in the winter though? Um, it is, but then you get the bad weather. But you but you but you don't get any midges in the winter. So yeah, so that's good. That's what I mean. Scotland has, is renowned for having terrible, terrible weather. Yeah, you, you have to very carefully plan your petrol stops because there's like two petrol stations on the route, sort of thing. <laughs> Yeah. It's, yeah. It's There's lots playing. of I other totally bits of Scotland it. to go to. <laughs> yeah, I want to visit Edinburgh, actually. Yeah. Well, go to Glasgow as well. It's, 
um, just as nice. Lots of Glasgow, Glasgow well, people are the <laughs> nicest, nicest people. They're really lovely. I want to go to and they're Loch only Ness. about forty miles apart. Yeah. I want to go to Loch Ness. I want to see the monster. Hmm. <laughs> you don't look convinced, Lona. <laughs> I've been to Loch Ness. There's lots of monster mids midges. <laughs> Is there? I'll take my spray. <laughs> um. Okay. On to the ending. Were you surprised? Also, yeah, that must be some unfairly, unfairly senior, hadn't it? To, to, to do all the manipulations and things. It was a bit of a a cop out in a way that it wasn't. Um, I was almost expecting it to be one of the team, you know, to be Ross or, or the. Oh God, I forget what the actual commander, or chief constable was, uh, name. But you know, I was almost expecting it that it was going to go along that route. So to just pick on a different deputy uh, chief constable, make it them, just seemed a wee bit of a cop out. And so the next question is always, were you satisfied? And Lorna's not entirely satisfied. Well, I, I can see how it had to be that way if you're going to make it a series. Mm. So I understand how it was like that. Um, you know, we're speaking about of a few pages at the end of the book, really. <laughs> yeah. What about everybody else's thoughts on the ending? Those that have finished it, because we have a couple here this month who haven't finished it. Uh, I, I, I mean, I, as I said, I was disappointed in the 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 two suicides, but that's a personal thing where I think they should face justice. But I, I, I was. Yeah, it, it was a typical ending where they got the brothers, but the main character, Tam Hardy, got away. Um, but, you know, he, he hadn't fled. You thought he'd have fled to, to Spain or you know, Brazil or somewhere, but he hadn't. He'd gone, he'd gone elsewhere. Um, you know, and I, I, I like the fact that, that they were still pursuing the, these people, but principally... They had to get the top person. They got they'd slowly picking off the lower level of the corrupt police officers. Uh, McGee, they got Sl Slatery, I think it's Slattery or Slatery. They got then, I can't think of the chap's name. Um, sort so of white, did you see us white? White, that's him, yeah, yeah, because he gave him a hard time, didn't he? Earlier yeah. on. We told him to F off, so I was quite glad that that's right. Yeah, yeah, was it, I mean, that was that was wonderful. Uh, I've got, I fancy doing that myself sometimes. Um, <laughs> but and and then principally, they had to find out who it was, and and obviously, they end up finding the, the main person. But I thought the way they they so much information came through, uh, it, it leads for more like the the leak coming from the London, from the Met up to support. So that's what gave Tam the, the quick getaway that he got the getaway. So there's more to explore in the future, I suppose, if you wanted to, well, it's written more books, but you know, I've not read them. So, mm. but it felt to me like there was more, they could have got more people. There, there should have been more because so much was coming out. They were constantly ahead of the game, yet there was only what, four people? Yeah. And he has mentioned um, returning villains, so. I will read another one. Yeah, so that's it. Who is going to read the next book in the series? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Clock. <laughs> so that's a majority for have enjoyed um, Dead Man's Grave. I'd still like to know why that grave had that inscription on it, never to be opened. The actual grave that that yes. inspired the story. The original, yes. the original yeah. one. I think it <laughs> might be a good idea not to open it though, <laughs> just in case. Who knows how much? How long can plague last? <laughs> plague bacteria or whatever it now, is. A real grave with never to be opened on. Mm. Yes, quite a mystery. There's part of you like let's open that grave, and part of you like no. <laughs> 
Um, does anybody else have anything? Does anybody have anything else they want to discuss or say about Dead Man's Grave? Um, the way policing is portrayed. What about how policing is portrayed in fiction by crime writers who haven't been in the service against those who have been in the service? Did you see any glaring difference? I think, I mean, I haven't studied it systematically, but it just feels like the dialogue and the interaction between the team members is just more natural by those who have been in in the police force. Um, you know, I, I sometimes I feel that those who haven't kind of exaggerate certain things, introduce all these uh, I don't know rivalries and you know which really you can't possibly have it quite like that because you have to work together as a team so yeah so sometimes I feel like oh you know aren't you being a little bit too much over the top you know just to introduce some kind of conflict yeah yeah Anybody else have anything they want to say before we move on to next month? Okay, I'll turn the recording off. Thank you everyone for joining us. Right, is that stop video or end stop video? No, stop recording. Because I don't want to close. Ah, stop.